Welcome to Anxious Like You, a podcast hosted by Micheline Malouf and Nadia Adesi, two therapists who are anxious like you. In each episode, Micheline and Nadia dive into their guests' experience with anxiety and give you the tools you need to face your anxiety head on. This podcast is made in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company. Today, we're speaking to Gabrielle Stone. Gabrielle is no stranger to the world of entertainment. She grew up on set with her legendary scream queen mother, Dee Wallace. After many years in the industry herself, Stone transitioned from acting roles to writing and directing. Her award-winning films, It Happened Again Last Night and After Emma, gained her awards for writing, directing, and acting. But she had a bigger role in life that would soon present itself, being a freaking badass. After the rug was vigorously pulled from under her when her husband's affair came to light, she found herself falling into the arms of another man. After a second failed attempt at love and a massive heartbreak, she decided that instead of landing flat on her ass, she'd make a career out of it. And so came the birth of the book, Eat, Pray, Hashtag FML, where she shared all the mistakes, all the lessons, and most importantly, how she became a fearless leader from it all. Welcome back to our podcast. Today we are here with Gabrielle Stone. We are so excited to have you. How's it going? That's so good, other than the fact that we're in a pandemic and the world has not resumed. But other than that, it's fantastic and I'm great. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so we're excited to have, yes, the pandemic is is going crazy right now. Like I know you're in the epicenter of things in LA. Um, in Orlando, I'm in Florida, so we're not as bad as you guys, but you can imagine how you know, people are just acting like COVID doesn't exist here. So, yep. (laughs) (laughs) so we wanted to, to dive right in and talk a little bit about, obviously you recently wrote a book, Eat, Pray, FML. And I think it's such an interesting story and we wanted to, to chat with you about it and what inspired you to write the book and tell us a little bit about what it's about. Yeah. So in 2017, I found out that my husband of almost two years was having an affair with a 19 year old for six months. So I filed for divorce, left. Shortly after that, I met a guy, fell madly in love with each other and had this whirlwind romance. And he convinced me to go on a month long trip to Italy with him. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he told me he needed to go by himself. And I was absolutely devastated. He broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. And I had a decision to make, and that was either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took a backpack and did six countries over the span of a month and wrote a book about it. (laughs) That is so amazing. I love traveling so that when I read your, um, you know, your, your bio and everything, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like this is, I, I have so many questions for you, but I want to start with, you were married for a year and a half when you found out your ex-husband was cheating on you, right? Yeah. How did that come about? How did you find out and how did it feel to, to find that? So I detail all of it in the book, which is interesting because I originally wasn't going to, I was just going to, cause that's not what the story is about. Um, it certainly sets the stage for it, but it's not what the, the bulk of the book is about. And um, when my girlfriend and I were talking about it in the early stages, she was like, no, Gabrielle, you have to write about how you found out because it was like an episode of CSI. (laughs) Um, And it, it very much was like, you know, we had been having problems for for about six months. Um, and we were in therapy and I was working really, really hard to try and get back to a place of love and happiness and couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And it eventually came to, he left on a business trip, um, left his email wide open on the computer in the office. Um, and I didn't even go looking or searching at first. I was in the office grabbing stuff out of our filing cabinet and the notifications started going off. And when I went over to look at it, I saw that he was taking an Uber from where he was supposed to be in Florida, funny enough, um, to Miami. And that was kind of all it took for me to be like, okay, something isn't right. And every receipt from the affair was, uh, from the affair was in the trash email. Um, and so I found everything that day but it was over the next couple of weeks that the depth of it all really started coming to light. Um, I mean, he had a second phone. It 
the dates that lined up with, you know, when he was with this other girl. Um, it was just kind of one blow after another. Uh, luckily, at the time, I had been so unhappy for so long that I wasn't really in love with him. I loved him, um, but I, I realized later on my healing journey that I married him because he was safe. Um, and it really, I'm thankful for that because I wasn't heartbroken when I found all this out. I was dealing with betrayal and rage, but uh, I didn't have that level of like despair, heartbreak that unfortunately came after with the second man. <laughs> Wow. 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 I can't even imagine. I know you said that you were experiencing anger and betrayal. Did you let him know that right away? Like, how did you confront him with what you found? Yeah, it was um, a weird situation because he was out of town on this business trip and the trip was two weeks. I found out at the beginning portion of that. And I didn't want him to know that I knew because um, I wanted to you know, be able to file for divorce and serve the papers and like get ahead of all that. So um, I had to really not talk to a lot of people during that two week period. I had, you know, my close girlfriends and my mom knew, um, mm -hmm. but it was probably the worst two weeks anxiety wise of my life uh, because it was like living in this constant state of fear and, you know, unknowns um, uh, as to what was going to come. Um, and even when he came home and we had that discussion, when he got served the papers, I, I really just, I didn't go off on him. I didn't yell at him. There was no, like, I didn't let any of my anger out, um, because it was so clear what was taking place and what he had done. Um, and I still didn't want him to know how much I really knew and how much proof I had of everything, like going into the legal matters. And um, it was really a simple conversation and he didn't really own up to anything. And I ended up walking out of the house and felt like a huge weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. Cause I knew I had just dodged a giant bullet and like he really was giving me an out to a really unhappy marriage. That's really interesting to me, especially because what you mentioned earlier before we even started talking about this was that the the man that you met afterwards really broke your heart in a lot more ways than your husband ever could. So it sounds like even, you know, in the relationship, you weren't really happy and finding out that he had an affair and cheated on you and that he didn't even own up to it made it so much easier for you to just walk away. So I guess the question is, what makes you, what made you stay in the relationship or were there any red flags? What, how did, how did that go about that led to, okay, this is now the time to leave, even though I was unhappy in the marriage. There were so many red flags looking back on it. Um, you know, he met me as an actress, that was my career and he was never really okay or supportive with it. Um, anytime I was away on set, he had these really emotional outbursts and like would be really upset if I had an on-screen kiss that I had to do. Um, and just really toxic, um, gaslighting tendencies of making me feel like I was doing something wrong when I was doing my job. Um, and I say all the time, I'm so thankful that he did something so drastic that it made it so easy for me to walk away. There wasn't even a question in my mind because you know, you, when you ask, why didn't you just leave before all this happened? It's, you know, I, I had gotten married. I had made this commitment. I had taken these vows and like, I was committed to going to therapy and doing the work and trying to get us back to a place of love and happiness that we did once have, albeit very, very fleeting and long time ago. Um, and you know, I, I had had this beautiful wedding that my mom had worked her ass off to pay for and all of our friends and family were there. And I, I didn't want to let everybody down and I didn't want to let myself down. Um, so although I knew I was really unhappy, it, it took something like that to make me be like, okay, see now everybody can see how horrible this has been. And like, I'm gone. Right. You also mentioned that you stayed with him because he was safe. Yeah. What does that mean to you? So this wasn't discovered until I was with the man who I fell in love with after. And I've grown up, I'm not like a 
stranger to trauma. I lost my dad really tragically when I was six years old. I walked in and found him dead on the floor. Um, my high school sweetheart passed away in a car accident really suddenly. So I've, I've had this belief of when I love people, they die. And that's, you know, my abandonment issues have stemmed deep, deep from, from those traumas growing up. And I remember very specifically, I was sitting with Javier, who's the man I, I was with after my ex, and he was going through a lot of grief about his brother, who he had lost to suicide a couple of years ago. And um, I was trying to help him through all this. And I looked at him and said, and he was like, I'm, I'm so scared that if I love someone as much as I loved my brother, that they're going to die. And I remember looking at him and I said, I so get that. I, I loved my dad and he died. I loved my high school sweetheart and he died. And then I married my ex-husband because I wasn't fully in love with him and it was safe. And it was a realization I had in that moment, in that conversation. And it was like, oh my God, how have I not put that together? And it made so much sense to me why, probably ultimately why I had been unhappy in the marriage even before he had started stepping out on, on our relationship. Wow. How did losing your father, you, you mentioned you walked in and, and found him dead. How did that impact your mental health? I mean, I think when you're that young, it's, it's traumatic, of course, and it's scary and it, it instills a lot of subconscious beliefs in you. Um, but they manifest later in life. So yeah, I was sad and I cried and, you know, my mom was an angel and did the absolute best any mother could have done. Um, but I don't think it really started manifesting me as far as my mental, in me and as far as my mental health until I was probably in my teens and started getting really rebellious and, and acting out. And I had a lot of anger and didn't know where that anger came from, but obviously it was from losing my father. Um, and then the abandonment issue that is left with someone when they, when they tragically experience death at that age, that really manifested in always needing to be in a relationship, always needing to have friends over, always like never wanting to truly be alone. Um, and that was my biggest thing throughout my whole life that I didn't know how to really fix. So when I found out that I was going to be going on this European adventure by myself. It was really the universe's clear way of being like, well, Gabrielle, you're going to go face that stuff head on and fix that finally in a big way. <laughs> That's a big exposure. Usually when it comes to abandonment issues, we're like, okay, let's start small. Let's try to reverse that from childhood. But you kind of just went head on. Right. <laughs> Travel right by yourself. How long was it for? Um, so I went for a month and I did six countries and because I found out 48 hours before I was going on this trip, I had no time to plan. And it was, I, I luckily our, our flight was to London and then was supposed to go on to Rome. So I have a, a friend from high school that lives in London and she welcomed me with open arms. And that was kind of like a really good home base where I could start. Um, but after that, it was like, well, where do I want to go next? And I would book the next city. And then when I was in that city, I would book the next one. Like I had no idea what I was doing. It was totally out of my comfort zone. It, it sounds both adventurous and uncomfortable and anxiety provoking all at the same time. All the things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so given the fact that you'd always been in a relationship, I know an, an excerpt from your book, it, it says that, you know, you learned one of the things you learned was that you felt like you always needed a man or had to be with someone. That was like the shallow level realization that you had. And then you like moved into other ones, which we'll talk about. But I'm curious as to how you uh, felt going on this trip by yourself after having your heart broken, you know, a couple night nights before. Yeah, I was absolutely terrified. Um, I, I was devastated. I, I had never had my heart broken before. Um, I had been hurt before, but never had my heart broken. Um, and it immediately, I think, changed me as a person and as a woman. Um, and going on that trip so freshly off of that. And I mean, we flew on the plane together. Like he picked me up to go to the airport. It wasn't like we changed our tickets, 
got on different planes. Um, although I will say because of how connected we were on a soul level and how quickly um, our love had happened, um, it wasn't, it was almost as if nothing had changed except we weren't holding hands and kissing. Like we were still very much connected and like almost transitioned into like best friends right away. Granted, I was still like crying on the inside, <laughs> um, but it, it was a really unique situation, but um, it was, it was a lot to, to feel that. And then on top of that, decide to go face these crazy fears of being totally by myself and flying across the entire world. I mean, I had traveled alone before, but like for work where you fly to a film set and people meet you and then you're with your film family, um, never just to solo travel with a backpack, much less like not even with luggage. And, um, the only thing that I knew about hostels was that there was a movie about them and people get brutally murdered. And like, I was like, what do you mean? I'm supposed to go stay in hostels. Um, have you seen Taken? Like what? <laughs> um, and so it was a lot of, a lot of heavy mixed emotions and, um, and a lot of fear, but I'm a big believer when you walk through the fear and you walk through the uncomfortable moments that that's where the real growth and power and change is. And this trip was a prime example of that. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of our listeners can resonate with, you know, that kind of situation, maybe not being on a plane with an ex that had just broken your heart, um, but just being around someone that has hurt you deeply and wanting to be with them and not being able to be with them. And that got like that, like you said, I'm on the outside, everything's good. But then on the inside, it's, it's like almost like this emptiness feeling less not and and feeling like your heart's sinking all the time that's not a short flight yeah no it's an 11 hour flight and it's quite long um it uh it, yeah everything you said is exactly right and it's it really is universal and I think that's why so many people connect with this book because we've all gone through heartbreak in some form we've all gone through grief in some form um, even men, you know, I have a lot of male readers that reach out to me because it's, it's a universal theme and it's something that we as humans deal with, you know, once or more in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once you got to Europe and you started traveling alone, you guys split ways and you went on your own. You said you were, you know, going from country to country, went to six countries and, um, what, how did you go about learning things about yourself and what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned? Oh my God. So many, um, my first really kind of big aha moment actually happened the first day that I was walking around London by myself. Um, obviously like I was staying at my friends, but she was working. So I just adventured around by myself all day. I had no idea where I was going and I had felt so empowered the whole day. And like, I was, I was like, I'm such a badass, And like, look at me, I flew across the world and I'm like arriving by myself um, and was feeling so awesome. And I remember I had stopped at a cafe and, you know, turned on my Wi-Fi, and a bunch of text messages had come in from Javier um, with like photos of him in Rome. And I took such a hit seeing it because that's where I was supposed to be with this man. I was supposed to be on those steps kissing you. Like, you know, I was so triggered by it. And I was so upset. I left the cafe and started walking back to the house. And in my head, I'm like, okay, Gabrielle, do you want to continue being pissed off and stomping your feet after you've had this wonderful day? Or do you want to figure out why and what's it, what it's about? Um, and I'm, you know, begrudgingly roll my eyes and say, okay, fine. Um, and it was walking on the streets of London that day where I came up with what I call the thought onion, which is one of my healing techniques in the book. Um, and it's basically my way to look at your thoughts and see what's at the deeper level and what's really causing them. So you look at it like an onion and the first layer is the superficial thought, which is obviously your brain's initial reaction, which is obviously superficial most of the time right. yeah. um, because we can't really control the emotions at that point. And then you take a step back and under that is the authentic thought. And that's usually the emotion that's causing that thought in the first place. And it's a little bit deeper as to 
why you had that initial reaction. And then under that is the subconscious thought, which is like where the real meat and potatoes is, which, you know, usually stems from some type of trauma or childhood belief that you've carried with you, um, really deep stuff. And when you can get to the subconscious layer, that's what you need to adjust and heal in order to have a different reaction moving forward. Um, so I used that technique on my entire trip with me and it really, there were so many things that I learned about myself just from using that. And I still use it, you know, on a weekly basis. It's, it's something that's so easy for any individual to do, to really examine what's, what's going on in their inner workings. And, um, but I learned so many things on that trip. I mean, my biggest quest, if you will, was to figure out how to love myself. Um, cause I never really knew how to do that or what that meant. And, um, that was probably the biggest thing that, that I learned. And we know for sure that that's not something that comes overnight. I mean, when you have a long pattern of not loving yourself and trying to find other people to put your love in, in order to love yourself, I know going away on a trip and spending some time isn't going to be the be all end all. Is that still an ongoing process for you? Is it something that you do daily or is it you feel like you've reached where you want to be? Yeah, that's a really great point and a great question. Um, so I was continually searching for this and felt this added pressure of like, okay, I have a month. I have to figure out how to, like, how to love myself. This is the month that I'm like going on my big journey. Um, and of course, when you're searching for something so intently, it's not going to come to you. So this realization came long after I came back from Europe and continued doing a lot of work on myself, uh, which is why I write about it in the epilogue of the book, because it didn't happen on the journey. Um, but I, I call it the self-love cocktail. Um, and it's really my answer to how to love yourself. And it, it has totally changed my life. And it's so simple. What you do is you sit down and you write out a list of things that you're capable of giving your soul yourself that you love. So my list was like dancing, meditating, eating well, going to the gym, creating, um, and you, you write down your list and you commit to giving yourself things on that list every single day. At first, it can just be one or two, and it'll be a stiffer cocktail, like a vodka martini. <laughs> um, and you commit for, you know, a couple weeks, couple months of giving yourself, you know, one or two things on your list. And then when you're a little more comfortable with that, you start adding in other stuff from your list until you have this like fun mixology margarita. And before you know it, you wake up and you're feeling so much better because you're loving yourself. And when I realized that loving yourself was as simple as giving your soul the things that it loves, and it was something that I could control and do on a daily basis for myself, it changed my entire perspective on it. I always thought that loving yourself meant looking in the mirror and being like, I love you, Gabrielle you're so wonderful. And I was like, every time I do this, I feel freaking crazy. Um, this isn't, this isn't really for me. Um, but it made so much sense because when you're in a relationship with, um, a significant other or, you know, a mother, daughter, or, you know, brother, sister, anyone that you're trying to make feel love that you want to give love to, you do things for them that, you know, they love and their way of experiencing love. So when we're trying to love ourselves, why would we not do the same thing for us? <laughs> and it, it totally changed my entire outlook. And it was like the biggest light bulb I've ever had. <laughs> I am so excited to announce that this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And as anxious like you listeners, you get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com forward slash like you. As a therapist who has their own therapist, I know how important therapy can be. Even though I have my own tips and tricks, having the space to be listened to in a non-judgmental, safe environment helps me every single week, even on my good weeks. BetterHelp makes going to therapy easy with its full online service. The best part is you can chat with a therapist through video, phone, or text, and you can schedule your sessions at any time that is convenient for you. As someone with social anxiety, I love the option for chat and phone as an easy way to start therapy and learn to get more comfortable. And I know how hard it can be to find the right therapist. Sometimes it takes months I've been there 
but BetterHelp makes this step easy. After you fill out a questionnaire, they match you to a specialist they think is a right fit for you. Once you give it a try, you have the option to remain with this therapist or find someone else that you think would be a better fit. So if you're still on the fence about starting therapy, take advantage of this 10% off and check them out at BetterHelp. That's better. H-E-L-P dot com forward slash like. I'm like mesmerized and I have goosebumps. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm a therapist. This is not something I, yeah, that, wow. That's awesome. And with your analogies, you have the margarita and the onion or those things you've come up with yourself. Yeah. You know, the thought onion, funny that you say that I actually, when I first wrote it, cause I wrote this book on the trip. Um, I started yeah. it the first day I was in Europe. I wrote it by hand in a journal. And, um, I remember writing it and being like, that's such a lame name. I have to change that in the future. And then by the end of my trip, it had, I had written it so many times that it kind of just stuck. So I ended up leaving it. And, um, and it, you know, people, people end up really connecting with it and loving it. Cause it's a really good analogy. Like it's something you have to peel. It's got layers, you know, it's not always the most comfortable thing to be around like an onion, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, the self love cocktail. It's, oh, I you know, that. I, I, you gotta like equate it to something fun and yeah. And <laughs> I love that you can like make different cocktails. It's such a fun yeah, way totally. to put it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like if you're, if you're not into alcohol, like self-love smoothie, whatever, you know. Yeah. Virgin <laughs> margarita. <Yeah. laughs> Absolutely. That is, that is amazing. And, and it's not an easy process. Did you have help from a therapist or did you read any books that helped you on this journey and come up with these things? Um, not come up with these things. No. I mean, I've been in therapy, in and out of therapy all of my life. I'm a big advocate of it. I think even when you are totally fine and mentally doing cartwheels, you should still be in therapy at some capacity. Um, because I think it's so important to continually have that outlet to express your feelings and, you know, sometimes discover new things that you didn't necessarily know were wrong. Um, and my mom is also, apart from being an actress, she's a world healer and does sessions with people all over the world every day. So I grew up in, in her house with a lot of really intricate healing work um, and, you know, letting go of uh, subconscious beliefs and um, releasing different traumas and um, clearing out energy blocks. So I come from that world. Uh, but as far as the the thought onion and the self love cocktail and these discoveries and these techniques, they they all originated with me on my trip. Wow, that that's that's amazing. I love them, and I'm probably going to use these with my clients. <laughs> <I'm along. laughs> um, I'm going to so, use them on myself. I'm excited right. to make that list of things that I want to do for me. Going to start making cocktails tonight. Yeah. <laughs> really life-changing when you can walk into the bathroom and you're like, Oh, look, my list, what am I going to do off of it today? <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I know that in your book, you talk, cause you're talking about self-love and kind of coming to that realization on your trip. There was uh, a part where you say, you know, fuck Julia Roberts because an eat, pray, love, you yeah. know, she's talking about gaining a few extra pounds and like, whatever, I'll just buy a bigger size pants yeah. and you were like coming to the realization is like yeah but like I don't feel good about myself fuck you Julia Roberts and so <laughs> what how how did that did, how do you feel about your body now and how did you start loving yourself in that capacity because I know that self-image is something that most of us do struggle with yeah it's a daily struggle it's not something that I waved a magic wand in front of and is totally fine especially after 2020 and being in quarantine I mean Get, having the gym taken away from me was like my therapy. Um, so it was, it was a lot, but I, I love that you brought that up because it, I have gotten maybe two or three and they're so specific in my brain because, you know, it's not at all how I intended it to be, but people that have been like, you know, you commented in the book a lot on your weight and that you were gaining weight and that you felt so uncomfortable. And, you know, these particular people had taken it almost in like a body shaming way, which is so not how I would ever intend to say that. Um, I think all body types are incredible and amazing. Um, what they probably didn't realize is that I've grown up in Hollywood as an actress on camera with people constantly telling me how I need to look to fit this mold to be successful. Um, apart from that, it really has nothing to do with 
my specific size looking on, on the outside in. It's just how I feel comfortable in my own skin. So even right now, I'm probably five pounds heavier than I feel really confident and comfortable at. But if you see me in a video and you're like, girl, you have abs, what are you talking about? Shut up. But that's the same that's the same kind of thing as like, you can't tell someone they're too skinny. You can't tell someone they're too fat. You have to just let them be comfortable in their own skin. While yes, I totally like, I love and appreciate my body and the fact that it does what I need it to do. And it like serves me and it's been this temple for me. Am I totally comfortable all the time when I've been pigging out in quarantine? No. And you, you're lying if you say you are. <laughs> like, um, So it, it really, I remember when I wrote that, that section in the book, it, it was so fun for me because I was obviously spoiler alert, laying there naked with a guy. And, um, <laughs> and I was feeling so gross about myself because I had been eating my face off and drinking. And like, I had put on, you know, I, I didn't obviously have a scale, but probably like 10 pounds on the trip, which is a lot in my frame. And it goes to those places that you don't want it to go when you're naked and having sex. Um, and I remember laying there and after, you know, we were all done, he looked at me and he's like, God, you're so sexy. And I was like, well, touche, Julia Roberts. All right, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's a personal comfort. Um, and it, it doesn't have to do with the number on the scale or how, you know, it's how I feel in my own skin and to everybody you know, to each their own. Everybody should, should feel that way and have that right to feel comfortable, feel uncomfortable, want to make changes. You know, it's not about not loving yourself. It's just a, a comfort level of where you feel good. And that's why on my self-love cocktail list, I have eating healthy and going to the gym because those things mentally make me feel better about myself. You know, mm -hmm. did that, the, that guy saying that to you, uh, God, you're so sexy. Did that shift anything? Did that, did a realization come out of that or was, how did that go? I think it made me realize just how hard I am on myself. Um, and that how I'm feeling on the inside is definitely not, um, always what people are portraying on the outside, which was a good lesson for me. Um, did it make me be like, oh, I should just continue to keep eating because who cares? And like, who cares if I feel like crap, you know, in my own skin? No. <laughs> um, I mean, I honestly, I wish I could ever get to a point like that, but it's just, it, it's, it's so much, it spans beyond being in Hollywood. And like, I struggled with, with different, you know, eating habits when I was younger and growing up. Um, but it's really about just how I feel confident and how I feel comfortable. You know, my boyfriend now would love me, you know, 10 plus or, well, maybe not 10 negative, but, um, you know, he would love me at any side, a size, but it's how I feel comfortable. That's important to me and how, how I feel, you know, physically, how it affects me mentally and, and how I want to, want to feel, you know, like you said to each their own. It's yeah. the way you feel your best. Side note though, you're naked lying in bed, pulling out your pen and paper, writing the book. Yeah. Is that how this went? <laughs> how did this go? Can you imagine, like, hold on one second. I yeah, yeah, I just kind of write. <laughs> no, um, so I definitely um, would take, you know, I still like lived my life. I went out and partied. I didn't sleep enough. Um, I saw all the sights. I did everything that you're supposed to do on, on a Europe trip, but honestly, the book writing it for me was like therapy. So I would go to a cafe and sit for five hours and, you know, eat croissants and like watch people walk by and like be in this beautiful environment, but I would be writing and it was really like therapy. Um, there were days in Amsterdam where I was at this, um, this air Airbnb style little house and it would rain and I would sit there for eight hours and just write and drink tea. And it was the best, like, you know, it, it really, this writing this book, physically writing it, you know, it's, there's a difference when you're at home typing on a computer, but when you're physically writing it and these emotions and these heartbreaks and these traumas are coming from your soul through your hand onto the paper, it's, it's the weird release that, is really kind of what got me through 2017, to be honest. 
And was writing a book something you knew you always wanted to do? Or was it all these things happen and you were like, okay, universe, you're sending me signs now. I'm going to put this out there. The latter, for sure. Um, I, I remember when I found out I was going by myself and Javier and I had this um, conversation as to like, okay, I'm still going to go too. And when he dropped me off that night, he was like, how are you feeling, Gabs? And I said, like, I'm about to go on a journey of eat, pray, F my life. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, and that's the title. <laughs> so it kind of just like, it, it was one thing after another to where my life had become this ridiculous, sad, but insane sitcom. Um, and I was like, I can't not make this a story and it's going to resonate with people because I know so many people have gone through at least some aspect of what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just, it was almost like the universe jumped into my, my room and was like, yo, this is the plan. This is what you're doing. And this is what you're meant here to do. I just needed you to know. So go do it. Like, I, I just clearly felt like I, it was what I needed to be doing. And I wrote it in three months, which is insanely fast. So it's kind of like proof that it was really like channeled through me and needed to get out. <laughs> wow. Wow. Three months. You just gave me chills. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that's amazing because I mean, yeah, you're right. It's, it's like when we're crying or when we're, when we're feeling as therapists, we always tell our clients, you know, write it out, journal it, get it out there. Yeah. And, and this is proof that sometimes, you know, that does need to come out of your system because otherwise we're just bottling things up and really struggling with it. So that's really fantastic that you were able to do that. Yeah. I, I tell my girlfriends that call me, you know, in the throes of heartbreak all the time. I'm like, dude, write a letter. Even if you don't give it to him, either write a letter because he's forced to read it and you're forced to organize all your thoughts and get it out or burn it or whatever. And then I laugh because I'm like, I didn't write a letter. I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> and he can read it. <laughs> Did writing the book help with the heartbreak? Um, it definitely helped me understand it. I won't say that it helped me get over it. Um, there's also, you know, so many things ensued when I came home, which is part of what stems off into, into the sequel book, but, um, which I'm currently writing. Okay. Oh yeah. But, um, but it definitely helped me know myself so much better and understand different parts of pain and different people's pain so much better that it was, it made me more equipped to handle it. I won't say that it like healed the heartbreak by any sense, but it definitely, um, it assisted in it for sure. Sure. And That's I hear awesome. the way you speak about your ex-husband and now the way you speak about your ex-boyfriend and you're so mature and caring and empathetic. Whereas yeah, me, I, I mean, feel like if I was in that position, I'd be like, fuck them all. You know, you have <laughs> such a great mindset towards them, which is not easy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's, I look at them very differently. My, my ex-husband, you know, I was so disconnected from that relationship the second I drove away from the house he very quickly just became a character in my story. Um, unfortunately, he as a person has resurfaced to um, uh, not be the greatest entity in my life, if you will, um, because of you know the book success and, and stuff along those lines. And I think oh. he's just got a lot of, um, I think he's, without you know saying he's a sociopath, um, <laughs> I think he's got a lot of anger. <laughs> um, mm. And, uh, but you know, I, I definitely, he, he really is just a character in my story. Um, as far as my ex Javier, that was a lot more, um, of a soul connection. And it, that was a lot harder, obviously of a heartbreak and, you know, it, it wasn't like he just decided to break my heart. There were so many different factors, um, that he had going into it you know, grief that I've also experienced. Um, so it was this weird, you know, I want to be angry at you and hate you, but I love you. And I understand what you're going through. Um, and I also, you know, to his, to his defense, he was so supportive. And the fact that I was going to write this, you know, I told him on the trip, I was writing it. Um, he and his mom and his sister, they all had to sign a release for me to be able to include text messages from them. Um, and he didn't even ask to read it before he signed that. He wow. read it obviously once it was published, but 
um, he was very like, you know, I owe you this. And like, I know how many people. Oh. So, so he's wow. a good person. Yeah. Deep down. Yeah. Deep down. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere down there. Are you guys still friends? Um, I wouldn't say friends. Um, and a lot of this, I don't want to spoil for, for the sequel, which he is in. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I know that I care about him as a human. I know he cares about me as a human. I know if I ever picked up the phone and needed him, he would be there in a second. Um, and you know, it's, it's difficult when you have such an intense relationship with someone to backtrack from that. Um, and I know that topic is kind of taboo and gets brought up a lot as far as like, oh, you can be friends with your exes. And I think it's possible, but when you're at a certain level of, of how intense and connected you were, it's really hard to backpedal from that and exist in a world where you don't have that element in your relationship. Not to say that I don't think that's ever possible, but um, you know, it's, it's a tangled web to try and work through. <laughs> Absolutely. Now I know, um, you know, I- I've traveled to Europe and had like similar experiences like that. And I know that co- it's like when you're there, you're in this fairyland, you know, you're, everything is new. You're trying new foods, you're meeting new people, you're learning about yourself. So it's, it's really like an eye opening experience. Um, but there's always that time when you just have to come home mm-hmm. and reality sets in. Did you yeah. ever have that? Oh my God. It's, yeah, there's multiple times in the book where I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to go home. Not only because you're absolutely right. There's always this, you know, vacation withdrawal where you're smacked by reality when you get home. But on top of that, I knew that I was going home to a really nasty divorce. You know, I had been getting emails from my attorney forwarded from my ex-husband's attorney that were like really just not great. Um, what should have been such an easy and like cut and dry divorce ended up being a really expensive, ridiculous, like angry divorce that it didn't need to be. Um, and yeah, so I was really, really not wanting to go home. Um, if my bank account would have allowed me to, I would have kept going for many more months, but it said, girl, no, you need to go. Um, and, uh, it really, it, I I really suffered from that when I got home, I was really depressed. Um, probably the worst, you know, I've battled depression on and off, um, throughout my life with the things that I've dealt with, but, um, that was probably the worst I had ever been the, the month that I came back from Europe because it, it was, yes, I had healed. And yes, I had like, learned so much about myself, but so many of those wounds were still open. And now I was coming back and coming back to my bedroom at my mother's house, you know, because I was divorced now at 28 and what the heck am I going to do now? Um, it was really like jarring for me to come home. And I struggled for, for a bit to to find my way out of that. And it wasn't until I found um, and discovered or created, however you want to call it, the self-love cocktail. And it wasn't until I discovered the self-love cocktail that I was really able to pull myself out of that depression. And it really was what saved me ultimately in that time. Can you talk about what it was like for you to experience depression, because like I said, like you were in that, in the trip, you were on a high learning about yourself and, and all of that coming home. What was depression like for you? Were you just like unable to leave the house or how did that show up? That's a really good question because it shows up in so many different ways, depending on what you're going through. Um, and that's not to say that I was just, you know, like riding high the whole time I was in Europe. There were days where I was at home writing at home, wherever I was on the trip, um, and crying and, you know, like really emotional or like really angry. Um, so it was a roller coaster the whole time I was on that trip. And it was, it was really when I came home and got off that roller coaster and everything was just stagnant where it was mm-hmm. like, there's no highs, there's no lows. I'm just at this constant state of uncomfortableness. Um, and for me, you know, I came home and I think a week later I was on set shooting something, but it really felt like everything was work. 
Um, mm -hmm. Like to get up and go to the gym was work, but I had to because I had to like, you know, work off the, the pounds I had packed on in Europe. Um, and I going anywhere was work. And normally when I am going through something, any type of trauma or grief or any, any emotional battle, um, I'm really diligent on, I don't drink. I don't, there's no substances. I'm very just like clear minded and like focused on, you know, eating right, getting to the gym, being healthy, like feeling good, meditating. And I didn't do that when I came back from Europe. Um, I was still kind of like, let's go out, let's drink, let's, you know, I, I needed that, that medication, if you will, um, to get me to a place where I could even like coexist with other people, which is so unlike me. I felt so far away from from who I am and what I normally am like. And I'm the person that will go out to a club till three in the morning and not have a sip of alcohol and still have a great time because mm -hmm. I'm dancing my ass off all night. Um, mm -hmm. So this was like very on the opposite end of the scale for me. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't like the depression that you can hide, like everyone in my life knew. Um, I, I didn't celebrate my 29th birthday. Like it was like very, it, it was scary. And, you know, I was living at my mom's house. So she was like really in the thick of it with me. And it took me a really long time to be able to, you know, be like, okay, this is like, the fact that I'm feeling this is a thing and I have to find some ways and some outlets to get myself out of this mm -hmm. like deep dark hole. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, struggle with suicidal ideation or thoughts? I didn't. Um, that was never, that was never an option for me. It was never a thought for me. Um, I had those when I was younger, like in high school, but I, I do think they were more of like the dramatic well, if, you know, X, Y, and Z happens, like, this is my resolution. I don't think they were valid. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's the right word. I don't know if they were concrete, but, um, but I never had those. It was more of just this, like, it felt like a brick was constantly on my chest. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't want to like function. Wow. How, I mean, with the cocktail that you came up with, you know, and the onion and, and your self-discovery, that sounded like that was part of your healing journey as well. So even though you were not feeling well, you were really depressed and heavy, you still practiced these things that you had picked up in Europe. Yeah, it took me, it took me a while to, um, and then I got to a point where I was like, okay, you know, I have to start making some changes to get out of this. Mm -hmm. So I literally, and this is how I discovered the self-love cocktail. I wrote down a list of things that were like, okay, this is what normally has made you feel good and happy in the past. Um, Cause even then I was so in it. I didn't identify with those things. I was like, okay, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to eat healthy. I don't want to, you know, not drink. Um, and this isn't saying that I was like an alcoholic, but I needed to not go out and have three or four, you know, cocktails yeah. while we were, you know, hanging out. Um, and so I was like, what in the past has gotten me to feeling better? And I wrote down that list and it was meditating and um, dancing and creating and going to the gym and eating well. Um, and I wrote that list. I taped it up on my mirror and I was like, okay, you have to do at least one of these things every day this week. And then the next week it was like, okay, you have to do two of these things every day this week. And it forced me to not only like have a task to you know, it was almost like, okay, if I go to the gym and I meditate for 30 minutes, then at least I can feel like I've earned laying in bed and binge watching a show, you know, like I could like earn how I was feeling. Right. It was a reward. Yeah. But then by doing those things every day consistently, I started to need that reward less and I started to feel better. So it mm -hmm. really like, it was out, it was without feeling like I was being fixed. I was being fixed. Right. Yeah. You were helping yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah. Did anyone in your life, like your mom, did you have them? I know that there's a helpful process of like, Hey, this is what I need when I'm feeling this way. Where did you have anyone in your life that you were, um, that was, you know, helping you get through those dark times and how did they know what to do? Yeah. My mom has been my one, the one constant in my life since, since I was born, obviously, but like, since my dad died, it's, it's always been her and I, um, she's the only person in my life that has never faltered in any way. Um, I mean, in any big way, she's not perfect, but like in any way that would affect, you know, my, my bond with her. Um, and it was really interesting because it was very difficult for her to watch me go through this twice. So my divorce affected her, I think more than it affected me because I was so disconnected from it right when it happened. Um, And then when she saw how badly my heart was broken by Javier, she hated him. Um, And and it was really difficult to be in a house and be with this person of my mom who I'm so close with and is my rock and my like go-to for anything and not be able to really express or talk to her about the fact that I am still desperately in love with this man at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really, really challenging. And on the trip, his mom was actually one of those people for me. She was, I I talked to her throughout my whole trip and she was so incredibly um, balanced and unjudgmental um, of the fact that it was her son that had done this and that, you know, she was able to like, not take his side most of the time. Wow. Um, And it really, it it was like kind of my saving grace because I've never been in a situation where my mom was so angry and so hurt and rightfully so that she was not capable of being there for me the way I needed her to be there for me. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, when the depression happened, when I came back, um, she was of course there for me and, and gave me anything that I requested you know or needed but um we weren't able to really like talk about Javier because she would just get so plugged into it um that it was it like wasn't worth going there with her and it kind of made it worse for me because from her perspective it's look how much this man hurt my daughter so of course I'm going to hate him the mention of which is valid and I get it it's warranted you know right it was really difficult for me to not be like, you know, wanting to talk about him and wanting to try and like, you know, discuss things that would help me move through that um, with my mom. And it was just, it was too triggering. It's very challenging because when you go through a significant breakup, you know, it, you want to talk about it. You want to get it out of your system. Like you said, and if your mom's been your rock your whole life, and then this is one where she's like, no, he hurt my daughter so much. There's no way I can talk about him. Then you feel a little bit isolated there. Yeah. Um, but his mom took on, which is impressive that his mom yeah, took on that role for you. Is, and I will forever be grateful for her for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really it's a weird dynamic when you're in a relationship and you've seen every single little detail that's happened and you know those moments that you've had together and then something earth shattering like that happens. The whole nother perspective and experience when you're an onlooker of that, not yeah. seeing those like deeply connected intimate yeah. moments, not seeing like how much they were really like driving this and feeling the same thing and reciprocating everything to then see something earth shattering like that happen. It's like, I can totally understand why everyone in my life absolutely hated that man. I mean, Mm -hmm. I had just gone through a brutal divorce. He had swept me off my feet, encouraged all the, the love behavior that was going on with us, convinced me to go to Europe with him and then freaking bounced. Like, I mean, those are the facts of it. So regardless of what I was feeling and how I was in it differently and defending it, like that's what everybody looking at it was experiencing. And I can, they're totally warranted for Mm -hmm. those feelings, you know? Yeah, we're just protecting you. In the book, are you going more into detail about your relationship with Javier or is it mostly your experience and your traveling? Yeah, um, so there's a couple chapters where 
you know, we first meet and we fall in love and it's the whole, yeah, like you go through the whole honeymoon phase with me. And that was really important for me to write about because I needed everybody to be on that inside with me. Yeah. Um, so that they understood the, the gravity of the rest of the journey. Um, those chapters were the last ones that I wrote when I came home and they were the hardest ones that I had to write because it was rehashing all, all the steps, you know, like when you go through a breakup, you're like, okay, let's go back and see where things went epically wrong. Um, there was none of that. There was never like a, oh, this is where this was like the red flag I should have paid attention to, or like, this is where I should have known, like, maybe don't buy your ticket. Um, there was never a moment where I went back writing that and was like, oh, this is where I misstepped. It mm -hmm. was really just like, it was really difficult. And it was, I was writing that when I came home from the trip. So not only was I in this like depression that I was in from being home, I was now going through old text messages from like this heartbreak oh. that I still haven't healed from, writing all these things verbatim about this man who like was so clearly head over heels in love with me. And it was like this like weird messed up masochistic way of like, you know, reliving all of it. It was mm -hmm. really difficult. It's re-traumatizing. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Twice you went through it. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you ever feel like, okay, there's a divorce. You were cheated on. Then you fell in love with this guy. You broke up fairly quickly after falling in love. Did you ever blame yourself? Did you ever feel like, Hey, something off with me? That's a really good question. And I think it's going to surprise people when I say no. Um, I, I knew in my marriage, um, his biggest and only complaint was that we didn't have sex enough. Um, and when I say we didn't have sex enough, I mean, we were having sex two to three times a week um, because I was, you know, at the gym and on set and working and we were, he was working and we were having lives. Um, he wanted to have sex twice a day, 50 shades of gray style. And I don't care who you are. That's never going to happen with me, nor has it ever. So I don't know why you married me if that's what you were expecting. <laughs> um, but I didn't ever feel like that was my fault. Um, and that comes really from me, I think, knowing my worth and knowing that and, you know, I don't know if I knew this when it did happen. Um, maybe it's from all the work I've done and like speaking out on it. You know, we did like a, a whole episode around this on my podcast, FML Talk, that um, is really about when you go through someone, uh, when you go through cheating with someone, it's not the person being cheated on. It, it could be with like the hottest person in the world or like the girl next door or some old person that like doesn't even interest them it's just about them getting the validation to fill whatever is missing inside themselves and you can't do a goddamn thing about that no matter what you're giving them um if they're not fulfilled with inside themselves and they're not able to love themselves in that sense they're gonna step out and find it wherever they can and it has nothing to do with you I love that you had that realization or you knew that about yourself because so many women struggle with that and men too. You know, we, yeah. we, we tend to blame ourselves so often when a relationship goes wrong and we, you know, the self-esteem issues and, and all of that. So knowing your worth is really important. I love that, that message. Yeah. And a lot of my readers that reach out to me, I know feel that way. And, um, I think it really triggered my ex-husband, um, in many ways because he would, you know, say things along the lines of like, you failed to ever take responsibility for what you did wrong in the marriage. And to which I would say, I know what I did. This is what you're talking about and what you're referring to. I've said it to my friends. I've said it privately. I've said it publicly. Um, I know exactly where, where you think my faults lie. That has nothing to do with why you cheated and why we're in the situation we're in now. Um, which, quite frankly, I'm thankful to him for, because he, 
he gave me an out to go live a totally different life and to be completely free. Um, so yeah, I think as far as the relationship after that, I didn't think something was wrong with me. Um, I thought something was wrong with him and that made me sad. Um, mm. it wasn't ever like, oh, I'm not good enough. Um, it was, it was, <laughs> it was almost like, why can't you see what's so clearly in front of you? And it took me a really long time um, and a lot more ups and downs with him in particular to finally come to the realization of like, you're just not the person that I built up in my head. You're not capable of being that person. And then you have to grieve that. And a lot of times people don't realize that grieving relationships are like grieving a death. Oh, yeah. And in some ways it's even harder because you're grieving someone that's still alive and you're like, you're choosing not to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a huge process to go through. Absolutely. It is the same thing. It is grief work. You, you, it's a major loss and it can be very traumatic on so many levels. Um, you're now in a relationship. Did you have anxiety about entering this new relationship after all your previous experiences? I did. Um, and I wouldn't even say anxiety. I, you know, and our, our crazy journey is all in book two. And I know all of my readers are so excited about it because they see him all over my, my social media now, um, and kind of want to know our origin story. And I'm like, I can't really tell you, you got to wait to read about it. Same. But, I um, saw him on your social media and like that you knew him in the past and like, I'm ready to learn. Yeah. More about it's, that. yeah. It's, yeah it's a, it's a really great story. And he is such a, such an incredible human, um, that has, I don't think, any other man on this planet would have been able to walk into my life after what I had just gone through, the state that I was still in, and allowed me to, to really move through everything and find myself and leave and, and do the things I needed to do um, other than this man. <laughs> um, but I did... I wouldn't call it anxiety. I would say that I was just like, I'm not getting into a relationship. Like there was, for some reason, whenever you put that like wall up, everyone comes running at it. You're like, no, 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 I'm good. And then the whole world is like, hey, we'd really like to be in a relationship with you. Um, <laughs> and there were a couple of people that I flat out was like, dude, I'm a brick wall. I can't be in a relationship. Like you need to walk the other way. I'm sorry. Um, and for some reason with, with Tay, um, he just didn't turn away. <laughs> um, and you know, it wasn't like everything has been peaches and rainbows because it definitely hasn't. But, um, once I was able to fully kind of like complete my healing journey with the heartbreak and the traumas that I had experienced, um, and find my way back to him, it was very clear that, I was subconsciously pushing away um, a safe love because the only love I had come to know was a toxic love. Um, and that was a huge realization for me to finally get to like, oh, like it doesn't have to be, you know, dramatic and psychotic and toxic and scary. Like it can just be safe and easy and comfortable and boring and that's good <laughs> you know like, yeah yeah so that was a huge a huge thing to overcome for me and it took some time um I'm just really lucky that the person on the other end of it was was patient with me absolutely yeah the boring is something I hear so often when people get into safer or better relationships for themselves not not safe in the terms you used it with your ex-husband but more of like that Okay, this could work. Security. Yeah. They say, you know, it's, I feel bored. And it's true, exactly what you said. Well, your whole life, you're used to these traumatic and intense relationships. So it's natural for you to feel like, huh, I don't know. Why isn't the intensity there? What's yeah. going on? Yeah. And I, and I struggled with that when we first were together because I was like, where's that thing that I was so addicted to with Javier? Where is that thing that made me be like, oh my God, I've never even been in love before because this is what it must be. Um, and that's toxic. Like that's not 
always the greatest thing. And that was a prime example of, you know, my situation was, you know, yeah, it was great while it was there, but A, it doesn't last and B, it's not always healthy. Um, so the fact that Tay and I took a long time really building our foundation of a friendship before we, you know, crossed into other areas was really important because he, I think if Javier had known, really truly known, I mean, he knew as far as like, she got cheated on and like, you know, her dad's died and like this sucks and like, she's been through a lot. But if he would have really known like my soul about my abandonment and stuff, um, I don't think he would have been capable of doing what he did in the way that it happened. Um, and the fact that I'm in a relationship now where you can, you can walk up to them and be like, these are my triggers. These are my wounds. These are the things that you need to never mess with. Um, and that person actually does that and respects that. Um, it, it completely changes the entire dynamic of what you think a relationship can be. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I know that no matter how bad of a fight we ever get in, he's never going to poke those spots that are really bad triggers for me. And that's huge. Did you just tell him that up front or was it a few weeks? How did, how did that <laughs> come about? We just sat down on our first date and I was like, look, here's the list. Um, <laughs> No, so he and I were, um, we had a friendship for about a solid month before anything else happened. And I mean, like, like five days a week, a month. Um, and we talked about everything. I mean, I remember sitting on his couch being like, look, dude, I'm still in love with my ex and like, I'm broken. Um, like I was just raw and didn't care. Wasn't trying to like make myself attractive to this person. Um, and he was also the first person to read Eat, Pray, FML, um, because I gave it to him to kind of like give me notes and feedback, him and my mom, but he was the first person to fully read it. Um, of course, in his mind, he's like, you know, eventually knows he wants more than a friendship with me. So he's trying to court me while reading like the shit show that my life has been, um, which was a wild experience for him, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, so he read firsthand. I mean, anyone that's read my book they really know me, you know, and I, I get DMs from my readers all the time. And they're like, I feel like I'm your best friend. I feel like I know you and like, you know me. And I'm like, yeah, you, you do know me. Like there, everything, every deep personal part of my life is in that book. Um, authentically and without, you know, any reservations. So I get why people say that. And I, and I love that, but he, so he experienced it you know, in that sense of reading it, but also in the way that I was with him. Like, I, I just didn't have any of those layers over me. I was just really, really open. And we talked about everything and, and we still do like, you know, there's, there's things that obviously come up in any relationship that, that trigger one or the other person. Um, and we're able to communicate really well around that because we've built such a foundation of like respect for each other. And is so this what we, sorry, no, sorry, go ahead. Don't... is this what we get to expect in your next book? Yeah. So the next book, um, goes from right when I get off the plane from Europe all the way to December of 2019. So it's been way harder writing this one, which is weird because you'd think it would be the opposite, but, um, the first one, Eat, Pray, FML, I wrote while it was happening. So it was very fresh. I was writing it literally day, like a day after my experiences, I would sit down and write the chapters um, or, you know, a week later. It was very, very, you know, as it was happening. Um, this one is obviously going back, you know, two years ago to this specific date, to this specific conversation. And it's like, just trying to map it out and timeline it all of like what I want to include and, you know, I, I've been bouncing around writing different parts of it. I haven't been going in order. So it's been a lot harder to write this one. Um, but yeah, we meet Tay in the second book and our whole crazy journey is in there. Um, when he came on my podcast episode, one of the the listener questions were, are you scared she's going to write a book about you? And he's like, I already know she's writing a book about me. I know what I'm <laughs> <doing before." laughs> Oh, that's great. 
But I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait for that. And I wonder what advice would you give your younger self? Oh my God, so much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Probably all the things that I've been talking to you both about now. I would be like, this is the thought onion. Do it daily. Um, This is the self-love cocktail. Practice it daily. Um, And you know, I've always been a big believer that everything happens for a reason. Um, but I would definitely reinforce that because I think I, I knew it, um, and believed it when I was younger, but I didn't fully, you know, 100% blindly trust in it. Like I do now. I mean, I am a walking example of that belief. (laughs) Um, and to just like try and relax and not take stuff so seriously (laughs) because it's all going to work out in the end. So to just kind of like let go of control. And uh, I mean, I need to give that advice to myself now. (laughs) Um, And to just kind of, you know, enjoy, enjoy the process, enjoy the journey. Let go of control and enjoy the journey. I love love that. that. Me too. I love let go of control. Where can people find you and Uh, find your book? I am on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook, mostly active on Instagram, uh, at Gabrielle Stone. And then my t- my TikTok, I think, is Gabrielle-Stone or Gabrielle underscore Stone, um, which is crazy because I was so reluctant to get on that app. I was like not wanting to do it. And then the pandemic happened and I was so bored. Um, but lo and behold, of course, that's where a bunch of my content has gone viral and gotten my book out to so, so many people around the world. I'm so thankful for it. Um, and now I totally love doing videos on there and interacting with people. It's great. Um, uh, but the book is on exclusively on Amazon. Um, it's Eat, Pray, FML, and it's in paperback, audiobook, which I narrate, and ebook. Um, and then you can also get signed copies on my website, which is eatprayfml.com. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Loved learning about your story and chatting with you. And I'm sure that our listeners are getting a lot out of it and can resonate with so much of your story. Thank you ladies so much. It's been so great to sit down with two therapists and like go deeper, um, (laughs) a lot of the, uh, the healing and the, the issues that I've experienced that I know so many people also go through. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Join the Anxious Like You community by following at Anxious Like You on Instagram. See you in the next episode.